Uh, this week I was, uh, I was running some errands, and as I was driving around, um, I realized I, I, I came to a very, very sobering moment in my life where I realized when I get in the car, I habitually have it on talk radio. Um, that means I'm old, right? Um, so as I'm driving, the, the news was on the radio, and uh, I'm listening to WWL, and they were talking about all kinds of different things. One of the things they were talking about was that this week, this past week, um, there was a major event that happened. All $1.2 billion of the lottery, right, happened. Um, now, I don't know if you know this, the Mega Millions, right, it hit at one, of its, one of its recent highs. Um, $1.2 billion was the jackpot, and they were talking about if you had bought your ticket. Now, I had not bought my ticket because I don't play the lottery. But I just was, as I was sitting there, I couldn't help but sit there and start thinking, what would I spend $1.2 billion dollars on. And I started sitting there and I'm like, man, we could have a church that could actually fit everybody. That would be nice, right? We wouldn't have people sitting over in the waiting room. Um, we could have a sound system that wouldn't go in the fritz like every 45 minutes, it feels like, right? Like it wouldn't, it wouldn't be no feedback, anything like that. Um, I, I started going down the list of just things and I was like, man, like, I, I could pay off these debts, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I could set up my nephew uh, for life, right? Like I got a little 10-year-old nephew, he's nuts, he's crazy, but I could set him up for life, like pay for schooling, pay for everything, he would have a, he would be able to live for the rest of his life and probably never have to work, which would be terrible for that little spoiled punk, but anyway, um, but like all of these things, like I was going through all these things that I could do, and as I'm sitting there, I'm like, I could do this, mom and dad could be set up for life. They need it, right? Like I, like, I got all these different things that I could just like, boom, 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 boom. That's awesome. And I sat back and I started thinking, that's not even like $10 million. $1.2 billion, and I can't think of what I would do with it. And as, as I'm saying that, like everybody here is like, hey, uh, Father, you want to help my brother out, right? But $1.2 billion, and I wouldn't even know where to start. The, the crazy part is, is that uh, uh, from a, a quick Google search, one person did get all the numbers uh, in Illinois. Now, whoever that person is, you can go hit them up for your student loans, right? Like, <laughs> but as I was th sitting there reflecting on this, uh, another, another story, another stat had came to my mom. 70% of lottery jackpot winners go bankrupt. Think about that. 70% of lottery jackpot winners go bankrupt. So somebody, right, heard to this week 13, 36, 45, 57, 67, and the multiplier 14. And they have a better chance of going bankrupt than not. If I really start thinking about that, like, like there's something wrong. Like you have enough money to set yourself for life. You should never have to have a problem for anything again. And a lot of us, I know, can sit there and be caught up in the dream of what we would do with that much money. But 70% of those people go bankrupt. That tells me the ache that those people deal with it has nothing to do with their bank account. That tells me that the ache that those people deal with, that all of us deal with, has nothing to do with what's in our bank account, or what we owe the bank. In a, in a similar way, in a, in a similar kind of space, um, so in my adult life, um, my, my weight has fluctuated from as high as like 325 pounds to as low as like 210 right, since I've been 18. I've been somewhere in between there. Right now, I'm like right in the middle, and I'm happy, and I'm feeling good, right? But like, I, part of me, I like over the course of my life, just this up and down, I have probably tried every fad diet that exists, right? I did the Weight Watchers, I did the No Carbs, I did the Atkins, I did the whatever, the, 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 like all these different things. I did keto for a little while, 20, 30, I did Octavia, I did that, like I did all these crazy things. And every time I did one of these diets, I, I, I realized that not only did I, I, so I lost the weight, but then give about six months, and I'd probably put it all back on and then some. 
this up and down. This is a, this, I'm, not a, I'm not an anomaly in this. There's like 90% of people that do these kind of diets. That's what happens. So if you're in the middle of one, good luck, right? Um, because the, the secret to health is very easy. Uh, move, eat better. That's it, right? You're welcome. You can take that to the bank, right? But the reason why I say that is because the number on the scale, a lot of times we think if we hit a goal weight, if we can just fit into that dress or those pants, not dress for me, don't worry, um, but in those pants, like if we can just get our waist down to a certain size or we get that number down on a scale to a certain number, then you know what? Then I'll be good. Then I'll be happy. But if it doesn't change a lifestyle, what happens, it bounces right back. Because the ache that we go, that we, that we, or in search of, the ache that we're looking to satiate, that we're looking to fix, that we're looking to satisfy in our heart has nothing to do with a number or a waist size. You see, every, every one of us has been created with an ache for God. Every one of us has an innate desire for God and God alone. God is infinite. And what happens is, is that most of, most of our culture understands that there's an ache, but don't know what, what's going to satisfy it. So what ends up happening in our culture, in our world, and possibly in ourselves, is that we search for this ache, we search for this desire to be satisfied by something of the world. Something that's finite. Now, I once heard it said that trying to satisfy an infinite desire with a finite thing leads to one thing, addiction. Whether your addiction is to power, is to money, is to fame, is to sex, is to drugs, is to drink, whatever it is, the, the innate desire that we have for the infinite, when we try and find it in a finite thing, it will not and cannot satisfy. But what happens is, we're going to search until we think it does. This is a story of much of our world. This is, the, this, this is the story of our culture at large. And we might not think, oh, Father, but that's not me. I, when I was in seminary, I remember I, at one point, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I think I was 22 years old. Um, and I had realized for the last six Christmases, I had asked for the new iPhone. Six years in a row, new iPhone, new iPhone, new iPhone. There was that one time where I kind of like jumped into it and I wanted an Android and that was the biggest mistake of my life because green bubbles are evil. And then I went new iPhone, new iPhone, new iPhone. But I just remember this moment, like there was, a, there was this desire that I wanted some kind of new technology and I thought that was going to satiate, that was going to satisfy the ache. But it didn't. This is why people are morons and will line up around an Apple store for days on end to get the new iPhone. Because it doesn't have a button this time. Ooh. But think about it. If, we, if we're really honest with ourselves, there are finite things in our life that we find ourselves desiring more than God. And most of the time it's because it's leaning in and playing on and pushing on this infinite ache that we have in our heart. What does St. Paul say to us today in our second reading? When we recognize this, when Christ, when you, Christ your life appears, then too you will appear with Him in glory. That whenever we see God, we see this infinite ache, when we recognize what we do, that we try and satisfy this infinite ache with the things of the world, this is what St. Paul tells the Colossians today. Put to death, then, the parts of, your, of you that are earthly. Immortality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed that is idolatry. Paul doesn't say just like turn away from it. Paul doesn't say just, you know, um, don't think about it. It's a big word. Put to death. 
these things. Cut them off. End it. I've been able to work with people in different... Uh, I was able to work when I was in seminary with some, with some people that were struggling with alcoholism. And the people that are successful that struggle with alcoholism, and I, I, say this in, I say this with all reverence, recognizing that this might be something that touches a lot of people's lives, right? But people that, that struggle with alcoholism, one of, the, one of the things that are recognized with the people that were successful in turning away from it was that they don't keep it with them. They don't go to the bar. They don't, they don't, pick, a, they don't pick something up for somebody else. They stay away from it. Because they recognize that this thing has a grip on me, and if I give myself over to it, if I put myself too close to it, there's a near occasion that I might take a drink. And I've got to get away from it. When we recognize the places that we're weakest, when we recognize those places that we're vulnerable, when we recognize those places, those things that we go to to try and satisfy an ache that only God can satisfy, the best thing we can do is to cut it off. The best thing we can do is to, as Saint Paul, to use St. Paul's language, is to kill it, to sacrifice it. So if social media is a temptation to sloth or to lust, cut it off. And I know that sounds radical. But would it be better to enter into, as Jesus says, to enter into heaven maimed without a hand or without an eye than to be stuck out of the gates of heaven with both? If the, if the thing that we try and satisfy our heart, like satisfy our, 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 this ache with, if the thing that we try and go to is more power or more influence or more money, how do we turn away from it? What do we give? This was, the, this was today's gospel, the, the, the parable of today's gospel. This is the sin of this man, is that he stores up the things of this world that will pass that will go away, that will be dated tomorrow. And God says, what have you given me? Today, as we come to this Mass, the the beauty of our faith, the beauty of what we profess and what we believe, is that, yes, while we are created with an ache and with this desire for God that is written into our hearts and into our souls, God has the same desire for you as well. That as much as we desire God, whether we are in touch with it or not, God desires us as well. And He doesn't settle for anything else. You see, when His desire for us and our desire for Him meet, that's where life will change. That's, that's where grace can abound. That's where God can, come, can begin to satisfy the deepest longings of our heart in ways that we may never have imagined. Tonight when we come to Mass... This is what we do. When when we come to every Mass, this is what we do. We allow the ache for God that we have and His desire for us to meet. That we can be in touch with the fact that we need You, Lord. That I need You, Lord. As He looks down and says, I need You to. I want You with me. May today... We not settle for anything less than what will truly satisfy the deepest longings and desires of our heart. And that's Him.